Hi, welcome to Board Gems. This is my regular video series in which I like to share my love of older board games with you. Most of them are gems, hence the name of the channel. I love these older games and I love exploring them. I love being able to check out on what's what we call in the hobby is the cult of the new, just always chasing the new thing. Now, I just explore the older games and I'm super happy with it. Now, older games often get reprints. The one I'm covering today has got recent reprints, but not with full, like, big distribution. Um, the original was published by Ravensburger in, I think, 2001, and it was designed by Alex Randolph. Now, if you don't know that name, you should know that name. He is a grandfather of modern board game design. I usually think of Sid Saxon, which in many ways was his contemporary. I usually think of Sid Saxon as being the more direct link to the old school German style games that I happen to like. I think of Alex Randolph more in the abstract game space. You know, he's made uh, very famous abstract games like Twixt is probably his most famous one. But there are some games, some of his newer games, newer for him because he's no longer with us. But you know, some of his older games date back to the 60s and 70s, but this one came out 2001. So one of his later games, published by Ravensburger, and it's called Big Shot. I need to give a shout out to Batuan in Munich, who was gracious enough to send me this copy, because this game is not easy to find in North America. And he was so generous to send me this copy of Big Shot so I could cover it for the channel. Thank you so much, Batuan, and I'm sorry it took me so long to get to it. The game is officially for two to four players. Um, in two players, you kind of control two colors. But, so I, I mean, there's lots of two-player games in the world. Probably you wouldn't pick this one if there was just the two of you. But it's basically the same game for three or four players. It's an auction game. There's properties on the board, and you will have your markers trying to have the most markers in a particular plot of land in order to claim it. And each plot of land is worth a certain number of points. But you're not putting the properties up for auction. You're putting up lots. All the player markers are distributed among a number of auction spots that go around the board. You roll a die, you'll move a pawn around the board to the next lot of markers, player markers, and players bid on those. And the winning bid gets to put them anywhere on the board they want. But, and Las Vegas did this more famously eight, ten years later, ties cancel themselves out. So it's, it's a pretty wide open game. It can result in some very wide scores, so be aware of that. Um, you'll probably want to commit to at least two games of this because the first game, you need to see how it works and don't be discouraged by a low score. Let me show you how it plays. Then afterwards, I'll tell you why it's still a gem today. To set up the game, Place the board on the table between the players. Keep the loan markers, that's these. They show 10 million, as well as sold markers nearby. Take the pawn and place it on any of the spaces around the board. I usually start it next to the Ravensburger logo there. Each player gets one marker showing their player color, as well as 10 monies. I'm gonna keep the die nearby. In this bag are 18 cubes of each of the four colors. You're going to mix them up and draw four at a time and place on every space around the board. If you get all four cubes the same color, put them back in the bag and draw again. There should be at least two colors in every space. If you want to be super fair about it, you could put out all these cubes in advance and then deal out the colors randomly. And you're ready to begin. The goal of the game is to have the most money at the end. You start with 10. You will spend money to try to claim these plots of lands on the board. And they have a value, money slash points, at the end of the game, showing here 20, 21, 16, 10, and so on. This pawn is going to move around the board, and wherever it lands, 
that's the lot of cubes that are going to be put up for auction. And whoever wins the auction gets to distribute the cubes anywhere they want on the board. At the end of the game, or when one plot of land has seven cubes, then at that time you evaluate and see who claims it. It's relatively simple area majority, except all ties cancel themselves out. The player who has the highest unique number of cubes in a space will claim it. The player whose turn it is, the start player, is going to roll the die and move the pawn that many spaces around the outside track, skipping any empty spaces. One, two, three, four. This is now the lot of cubes that will be auctioned. The player to the left of the current player starts the bidding. They can bid any value they want that they have. This is important. You cannot bid more than you have. Also important, all money is visible to all players. So the player to the left of the player who just rolled the die, the current player, the player to their left starts the bidding, calls out a number that they have, or passes. If they pass, they're out of the auction. And then it goes to the next player who has the option of raising the bid or passing. Once per auction, I can take a loan. I take one of these tokens. It shows 10 million, but I don't get 10 million. My first loan, I will get 9 million. I can only take at most one loan per auction. Now that I have some money, I can then increase the bid. You cannot bid an amount of money higher than you have. If you've maxed out your money and you want to increase your bid, you have to take out a loan. Even if you don't end up winning the auction, you've still taken out the loan. If on a later auction, you get a second loan, for a second loan, you will then only get 8 million. And the third loan you take, you'd only get 7 million, and so on. At the end of the game, you'll subtract 10 for each of these loans that you've claimed. So the bidding continues around until everybody has passed except one player. That player pays their bid to the bank, and they take these cubes and they place them anywhere they want on the board. Of course, you can put them all on the same plot of land or spread them out however you want, but no plot of land can have more than seven cubes. Once a plot of land has seven cubes in it, immediately you evaluate it. Let's say this property now has seven cubes, so we evaluate it. We Eliminate all tied numbers. There are two whites, two blacks, two yellows. They are all eliminated. And then the sole red one would claim it. And you would take a sold marker, like so. And now this plot of land is now claimed by red and will stay so until the end of the game. As you'll notice, these five plots of land are quite valuable. These six, not so much but you'll notice they are adjacent to parks. Parks are evaluated just like any other location. As soon as it has seven cubes, it's evaluated. The winner gets no points directly. Parks themselves are worth zero, but every property they have that's adjacent to that same park is worth double. So in this case, this property is now worth 20. This property is worth 18. This property is still only worth 11. It only doubles the value of adjacent properties owned by the same player who owns the park. After that, the die passes clockwise. The next player will roll the die and move the pawn that many spaces clockwise. And this will be the lot of cubes that is put up for auction. Remember, you skip over any empty spaces. And in this way, all 18 lots of cubes are going to be auctioned off. And after the 18th lot is auctioned, the last lot is auctioned. That's the end of the game. And any properties that still don't have seven cubes are evaluated based on the cubes that are there now. So this one, if, this was all, if these were all the cubes that were in this place, then obviously white 
would get it. And players will total up the value of the properties they own, remembering to double any that are adjacent to a park they own. Add to that any money they have left over and subtract 10 for every loan they have. The player with the most money wins. There is a small rule that the winner must own at least two properties by the end. So you can't just hang on to your money. Even if you see other players just bidding crazy amounts, you can't win just by sitting out all the auctions and hanging on to your original money. You will have to own at least two properties in order to win. So you'll notice there's four colors for four players. So what happens when you're playing with fewer players? Well, the three player game is exactly the same. Obviously, one of these colors will not be in play, but you can still play the game with the exact same rules. The player who's not in the game can still be based on the, the placements of the actual players around the table, can still win properties. All four colors will always be in play. How about a two player game? Well, in a two player game, as you might guess, each player will control two colors. They will maintain two separate amounts of money, but in an auction, they bid any amount that one of the colors has. Each color will have its own separate money and claim its own separate loans. Unlike in the regular game for three or four players in which you can take loans in the middle of an auction, in a two player game, you can't. You have to ask for loans between auctions, between turns. You don't have to bid separate amounts for the two colors you have, you just bid an amount. And if you win the auction, you can choose which of your two colors will pay for the auction. At the end, you will total up the money and the property values and the loans of both colors. Both colors have to claim at least two properties in order for you to be able to win. That's it. You're ready to play Big Shot. Pow, pow. I described Big Shot in the past, like for example, to members of the OG Guild, as a raw game. That might seem like a strange characterization of a board game. Let me try to explain. Many board games are a mishmash, a smorgasbord of many different types of mechanisms, especially the, obviously the more complicated ones. Oh, there's push your luck, there's dice rolling, there's worker placement, there's auctions, there's deck building, and a lot of games are some combination of these what have become relatively standard tools in a game designer's uh, tool belt, so to speak. To me, a raw board game is one that is rather minimalist. It focuses on the core part of what makes a game interesting and tense and fun without too many uh, accoutrements. Uh, you know, you're just having the main course, there are no side dishes, um, and it's not a variety of a meal, you're eating one thing. <laughs> My wife jokes with me that, you know, she likes to have lots of little dishes, and I'm like, no, I just want one thing that I like, and I'll just eat that, please. <laughs> And I guess that could apply to my taste in games as well. I often like raw games, games that are rather minimalist. They have a focus. Because I always like to say that every game that is published should be someone's favorite game. And what I mean by that is it should be different enough from other games out there that for someone, that combination or that, uh, that focus is exactly what they're looking for. And there are many games that I've played that have that mishmash of mechanisms. And you feel like it has a lack of focus. And because all these mechanisms are things that other games have done, and oftentimes better, those games become forgettable. I could totally see Big Shot being someone's favorite game. The focus in Big Shot is twofold. There are the auctions, and there is the, I guess you'd call it area majority. These two elements, I'm sure you could name a dozen games that also feature auctions and area majority. These are not rare mechanisms. But for one thing, the, the laser focus on these things and the little small adjustments that are made 
to make it very interesting. In, in the case of the area majority, that's the ties, which we would later see in Las Vegas, another game I have covered that eight to 10 years later, I think uh, Las Vegas came out. And that game featured ties as well, that there was, I suppose you'd call it area majority. You'd have these casinos and the dice would go to the casinos. The, play, the dice are owned by the players and the player with the most dice wins the money at the casino, but ties cancel themselves out. Because each plot of land can only have at most seven cubes, ties become extremely common. You often see three, three, and one, or two and two and two and one, and the one ends up winning it. But what that means is every auction is tense. Every auction matters. Well, maybe not the first couple. One flaw you could potentially see, or at least it's something that keeps you from kind of getting into the game is that the beginning feels rather directionless. The board is empty and the early auctions, you're putting cubes on the board, but because ties are relatively easy, it's hard to justify putting what cubes where. But usually those auctions don't go for very much because you know, you don't have anything you have to do right at that moment. It is hard to see how those early placements affect the late game. But starting, oof, I don't know, maybe one quarter, one third of the way through the game, the auctions become extremely important. Each lot of cubes, there's four of them. And once a location on the board has three cubes, suddenly the stakes shoot through the roof. Because one player at the table could take all of these four cubes that they win in, our, in this auction, plop it down in that space that already has three cubes, now it has seven, someone will win that. Which player wants to win that so that they can claim that location? You want to bid high to keep that player from getting an easy win of points without spending too much money. You want to bid them up. But do you really want to win it? You could definitely do something with every auction you win. You can do something with those cubes, but you know for sure you definitely don't want that person to win it. Or if they win it, pay through the nose for it. And paying through the nose, that's key in this game because of the other twist. You start with $10, but there's like a dozen blocks, plots of land on the board that you could win. That 10 bucks is not gonna get you very far you are going to need to raise capital during the game. And the only way to do that is to acquire loans. But the loans are brilliant. The first loan you get, you only get $9. The second loan you get, you only get $8. The third loan you get, you only get seven. It's diminishing returns and it makes it more and more painful to borrow more and more money. At the end of the game, each one of those loans, you have to pay back 10. And money is victory points in this game. Negative scores are actually rather common, especially in first games. There is the temptation that in order to try to win, you have to borrow more and more money because you need to win as many auctions as you can. And that's... That's dangerous thinking. That's a thinking that's going to set you on the wrong path. Because every auction matters. Obviously, they matter different amounts to different people. And where the auction happens, like when, at what point, if it's early versus late, or which cubes are, are in the, the lot that's being auctioned, are vitally important. But it means that they're important in different ways to different people. And every auction feels important, but you obviously can't win every auction, can you? So you really have to be picky. Take the opportunities when they come. If you can get a lot of cubes relatively cheaply, go for it and save your money for the really important ones. But it can take a play or two to identify which are the important ones. I only say that because it is very obvious when a, a block has three cubes and it's like, oh, Somebody puts the next four in there and somebody's definitely going to win that. That's very easy to identify. 
what I'm talking about is that because the feeling you have is that every auction matters, it becomes a little bit challenging to figure out these are the ones that I don't want to spend very much on, and these are the ones I want to spend a lot on. They all feel important. There are many auction games in which player money is hidden. The idea is that you're not supposed to care or be able to calculate exactly how much your opponent has so that, you know, you avoid the situation where, you know, I'll bid five and that's exactly how much money you have. <laughs> so I can be assured to get it for that amount. And a lot of games try to hide the amount of money that players have just to discourage that sort of precise bidding. But that's what this game is about. Money is open, and precise bidding is extremely important. If I were to bid three on something, but I see somebody else who wants this only has four dollars left, you can bet I'm going to bet four, not three. Because I want to give them a tough decision. That tough decision is, do I stay in or do I drop out? Because staying in means taking a loan. And each loan hurts. <laughs> the first loan, maybe first two loans, you're like, ah, it's not, you know, whatever. You got to spend money to make money. But then once you're into like the third and fourth loan, it's like, oh my God, I do not want to get another loan. Being able to identify very clearly, it doesn't try to hide it. It's very clear how much money each player has, how many loans each player has. And that will 100% affect your bidding. And another important aspect is the fact that you can't just take a loan whenever you want. Each auction, you can only take at most one loan. You can take multiple loans over the course of the game, but each time you're in an auction, you can only take one. Some games will set it up such that, you know, you can bid whatever you want, and then if you win the auction, okay, I don't have that much money, I will take loans. Oh no. No, 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 no. To even bid, you have to take a loan. So I have five, you bid five. Now I have a decision to make. Because I could take that loan, but maybe I don't want to take the loan. Maybe that's my fourth loan. And I'm only going to get six bucks instead of ten. And I could take that loan. Maybe in the end, I still don't even win that auction. Maybe you still win it based on how much money you have or whether you're willing to take a loan. And I just took a loan without getting anything for it. <laughs> you know, Big Shot, it can be hard to see on a first game what to do to win, but it's short, it's simple, and it's interesting. And if you like that combination, it may be worth it for you to play it multiple times. You know, in that first game, someone might win with 15 bucks, somebody else might have 5 bucks, and you might have negative 30. It's painful, but it's kind of funny too, isn't it? <laughs> have a laugh about it. Next game, you'll do better. There's multiple random elements, which obviously make every game interesting, but also means that you should probably have a look at the board at the start. You'll want to see whether your cubes, or, or other players' cubes as well, are clumped together in relatively few lots. So there might be multiple lots where you have three of your color in there, or they're relatively distributed. If they're relatively distributed, you don't want to spend too much money on the auctions, right? You want to, you want to be opportunistic, right? Other players can be putting your markers down somewhere. You want to save your money. And then when you see you can jump in and claim something, then you do so. And you might be able to get more out of your out of your pieces because you have a limited number of pieces, right? Each player has only 18. So you don't want to win necessarily properties with uh, four of your cubes, like an outright majority, because those four cubes aren't being used anywhere else. You get more mileage out of them if you're able to win ties and other players end up wasting their markers putting multiple markers in the same spot, but end up tying with somebody else. And then the one person left over with their single marker ends up winning it. You get more mileage that way. 
But if you see that your markers are relatively grouped together, there's a number of groups that have a lot, let's say three of your color, then, then in that case, you probably want to be a little bit more aggressive. You're going to have fewer opportunities to get your markers on the board. And when those lots come up, you want to win them. You really do, because you don't want three of your markers to be distributed on the board by somebody else, right? You want to have control of that. So how the markers are distributed is important, but of course the order they come out, you don't know that order. It is something that gives me a little bit of pause, is that if your markers tend to be in the early lots that are auctioned, your markers get on the board early, I find that to be a disadvantage because it's easy for people to dump other markers in there and make those ties. Because if you win, like if the first lot has three of your markers, you want to win that. But what are you going to do with them? If you spread them out, it's very easy for other players to crowd it out, you know, with ties. But even putting three in a single location is not going to guarantee you that location. And overall, that may be worse than having your, your markers spread out. It is better to have your markers come up for auction later in the game compared to earlier. Um, I'm not a very good big shot player, so I don't know how to overcome that yet. But I like playing this game. I like to play it multiple times. And you know, not every game is going to be like that. The distribution is going to be different every time you play. And I like that the game plays identically for three players versus four players. Because the three in the three player version, you still play exactly the same way, including with all four colors. There's just one color that's not controlled by any player. That color slash player doesn't exist. They're not going to be bidding and they can't choose where cubes go, but there's still cubes that are auctioned and the other players will still be able to put them on the board and they can still wreck the plans of other players. You know, if they end up tying them in, in certain uh, locations. So it works just fine with three or four. It is better with four specifically because of the auctions. Generally speaking for auctions, I mean, auction games can work three players, but I can't think of an auction game that works best with three players. Almost any auction game I can think of that you can play three players, I'd rather have four. And it's the case here as well. With four players, there's less responsibility on a single player to try to spoil the plans of another player. In an auction, in this type of auction, once you're out, you're out. That's it. You're gone. You can't jump back in later. So let's say that there's an, a lot of cubes, uh, four cubes up for auction. Player A really wants it. They're bidding last. You have players B and C. Player B passes immediately. B is pressuring C to you better not let A have that, you know, you know they're going to win the game, you know, maybe, you know, they're going to get a lot of points if you let them have that. You better not let them have that, yet they're not contributing at all, right? They pass immediately, putting the onus uh, on the next player to stop them. And, of course, you see that less with four players. Uh, it's just a different dynamic, you know, that, that's more of a, of a player kind of dynamic that uh, doesn't really bother me when it comes up. It's just kind of funny to do. You know, people can do it to you, but you can do it to other people, too. So <laughs> I don't really see much of a problem with it. But the game is slightly better with four. Really simple rules that just allow you to jump in. A lot of interaction with the other players on a shared board that everybody's focused on. And the challenge is coming from the other players and their moves and how you counter them. Uh, it's thinky, but it's not complex. I mean, this is this is what you want. It's what I want, might be what you want. This is the style of game that I like to promote. And, you know, if you're getting tired of the newer games where you're always learning a new thing and it's kind of, you know, it's not necessarily that crazy complex. Look, you're smart, you can figure it out, but you might only play it once or twice before you're learning a new game. Remember why you play board games. For the fun of it, from the game, and from your fellow players. Thanks for watching. Remember, older games like Big Shot don't stop being good just because newer games come out. Take care.